So I hope you can all see that fine. Um, yeah, so I'm going to speak to you today as I was introduced for the Q Science Collections Digitization Project. So digitizing the collections is one of the top priorities in our new science strategy, um, which was launched last year. And the strategy sets out how we will focus our science to fulfill um, our mission. And that is to understand and protect plants and fungi for the well-being of people and the future of all life on Earth. And um, this is an ambitious plan to help stop uh, biodiversity loss and develop sustainable nature-based solutions to some of our biggest global challenges. So as we all know, we have a lot of challenges facing us today and Q really wants to play a role in trying to solve some of these. So our collections is one of our strengths that enables us to undertake this mission. And um, so first of all, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of our collections. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of what uh, Q, Q has. And um, we're, we're much more than the living collections in the Botanic Garden. Um, the largest collection is the herbarium, where we have over, uh, around, we don't really know until we digitise it, so that's one of the reasons, for, for one of the advantages of when we digitise, is we have 7 million preserved vascular plant specimens that are arranged by family, genus and species for study. And this collection is representative of global plant diversity, and it contains around 95% of vascular plant genera. And the herbarium, which was founded in 1852, but many of its subsequently donated collections actually contain also earlier material. And then we also have a fungarium, and we hold over 1.25 million dried fungi specimens. Um, Q's fungarium collection is the largest and one of the oldest and most scientifically important in the world. It was founded in 1879. Um, and in 2007, the International Mycology Institute Fungarium, which is owned by CAB International, was housed alongside the Q collection. So this adds very substantially to our overall holdings and gives us over the 1.25 million. And um, then we have spirit collection. So we have plant specimens preserved in fluid and stored in glass jars. And that's you know, used when drying, pressing and mounting on herbarium sheet is unsuitable. So when you want to particularly observe three dimensional arrangements of flower plants or fruits, and we have like a lot of orchids and palms in spirit. Um, then many of you have probably heard about our seed collection at the Millennium Seed Bank. Um, this is based in Wakehurst Place. Um, it's the most diverse wild plant species genetic resource in the world with over 2.4 billion seeds representing almost 40,000 different species. And Q seeds are collected, the, the seeds are collected through global partnerships and fields research as part of the Millennium Seed Bank partnership networks. So Q very much works with many uh, partners around the world. Um, then we have the microscope slide collection and that holds around 150,000 slides which includes leaf surfaces, sections, pollen, wood, roots, and chromosomes, and the economic botany collection. So um, that's over 100,000 objects, and that's sort of any sort of objects that are derived from plants and fungi that are used by man. So these will include things like bark cloth, baskets, botanical jewellery, Chinese traditional medicine. If you ever get a chance to go and have a look around the collection, it's so, it's so fascinating to see all the different things that are there. Um, and then we, we also have a, a tissue bank and DNA collection, and this contains approximately 60,000 samples representing nearly all plant families and over half the genera of flowering plants. And the composition of this generally reflects studies carried out at Kew over the last 25 to 30 years. Um, and then we shouldn't forget our library art and archives collection. So the library is again is one of the largest collections of botanical information in the world. We have 200,000 botanical prints and drawings, and our archives contain the official records of the Royal Botanic Gardens queue. So we have personal papers of many botanists, gardeners, and other individuals, including Charles Darwin, Joseph Hooker, and Marion North. So collections are the, the answer to many scientific questions. So how particular are specimens used? Well, they act like a reference library that you can return to. So each specimen is an, is an immense source of information that can tell us what plants look like, where are they found, what environmental niche they occupy, when they flower produce seed. They provide the basis for modeling distribution over time and help determine which species are threatened by extinction. They also act as a source of material for anatomical, biochemical and phylogenetic analysis. So how species are related to each other and evolved over time. And in the collection, we have like wild crop relatives. So they're potentially new crops and also new medicines. 
So um, our science strategy has five different priorities, but priority three is we've called the digital revolution. And it has three initiatives, which is the first one is digitizing the collection. And this will really provide baseline data that can be used in other priorities. So we are prioritizing the herbarium and fungarium collections for digitization. Um, but we also want to make links between the different collections that we've got. So we need to integrate the specimen data with the, all the different collections and also data, um, other data about the, the, the plants and the fungi. So about the world checklist data, which is like a global consensus of all known vascular plant species and associated information on their distribution. And the last part is all about sharing this data as widely as possible. So we want it, we don't want to say obviously just this data just used by Q, we want to use this by as many researchers around the world as possible. Um, so what is digitization? Well, in its uh, purest form, it's like converting physical to digital information. But um, this is what we mean at Q by what we mean by digitization. So here is a typical herbarium sheet. I hope many of you will be familiar with it. Um, the first step is that we add a unique identifier, so a barcode. We capture any folder level information. And then you would capture, capture one or more high resolution images and then capture the specimen label information into a database. So key information on a specimen include what species it is, things like who collected it, when it was collected and where it was collected. And of the newly collected specimens would have GPS coordinates. So even though we're now embarking on a large digitization project, so Q has been doing some digitization for a long time. And when we really started, uh, which is the same time as I arrived, as we mentioned in before, we were a digitization officer on what's called the African Plants Initiative Project, which was funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And in 2004, it did not really seem possible to be able to digitize the vast collections that, that, that we had. And um, the technology really, really wasn't there at the time. Um, so we prioritize type specimens. So a type specimen is a particular specimen, um, or in some cases, a group of specimens of an organism to which the scientific name of that organism is formally published. So the specimens are cited when a new species is published. So it's really a specimen selected to serve as a reference point when a plant species is first named. So they, they are the most important specimens for plant taxonomic work. So the project started with Africa and then expanded because it was successful, expanded to Latin America and the rest of the world. And it was a very large project with around 300 partner institutions in around 75 countries. And Q also was involved in sending uh, with training um, and digitization and sending imaging equipment around to other partners. So all of our type specimens were digitized um, and that was around 346,000 specimens. Although they'll be, although as part of this mass digitization project, we'll be finding new types in the collection that we've not yet identified as types. And then new species are being described all the time. So we're digitizing new types as they as, as they are designated. Um, and then one of the other biggest digitization projects that we have was called Reflora. So this was an initiative particularly to increase access to and use of Brazilian plant diversity information. Um, and this was deposited, you know, that are deposited, deposited in institutions within and outside of Brazil. So Q was involved in digitizing our specimens. So they were barcoded, folder level information captured and imaged at Q. And then this time the label data, the label images were sent to Rio de Janeiro Botanic Gardens where their staff did the transcription. So this was making use of local expertise on localities. And then an additional aspect of this project was exchanging expertise. So over 110 Brazilian-based scientists, including many postgraduate students, made study visits to Kew within the framework of this project. So they have participated in almost all aspects of the project. They selected material for digitization. They provided authoritative identifications. So they were looking at the, at the material, material and naming it. They were gaining expertise in digitization approaches and they collaborated with Q scientists. They discovered species unknown to science and well as recording dozens of species not previously known to occur in Brazil. And then this images and data are available on Q's website and also the Reflora virtual herbarium. So Q had over 264,000 specimens digitized that way. 
And so we've had a number of smaller scale projects over the years. So generally they're for particular you know, science, like scientific purposes. So for example, we have digitized all our collections of Dalbergia, which are rosewoods, pterocarpus, and a number of other legume species. So when most people think of the most widely traded illegal wildlife product in the world, you might probably think of ivory or rhino horn, but it's actually in fact rosewoods. So this project was completed in collaboration with the Natural History Museum London and Edinburgh, and Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. So all the information from the collections were available from research. Um, so the data is already fed into conservation assessments and a CITES uh, checklist, so the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, they will be published soon. So all this, the herbarium data was, has sort of was used um, after this project. And finally, this is a funding example. So um, we digitized specimens on the UK plant health risk register and genera known to be pathogenic, such as rusts and smuts. Um, so this provides a source of data to facilitate research into the plant pathogenic fungi. So it includes data on the distribution of the fungi and their host relationships. Um, in this case, we were imaging collection labels, really, rather than the specimens themselves, as the images are not as useful for identification purposes. So in this case, actually, we use volunteers to help us capture the information. And, and this was um, captured using crowdsourcing, which I'll going to talk to you a little bit about later. So this is kind of an overview of there are many projects that we've involved with the digitization from ones that are purely digitization to one where digitization is just a small element of the overall project. So some projects may need to database just need to database the label information and not image the specimens. And then we have individual staff, honorary research associates, volunteers and visitors who are doing um, certain aspects of digitization for their own research projects with volunteers helping particular researchers. Um, then we have image requests. So any other um, research from another institution who think they want, they want specimens that would be deposited at queue, they can request them to be digitized. But there is a limit on this just because the amount of requests that we get. So one request would only have, have like 20 specimens. So currently we have digital records of 1 million herbarium specimens and approximately 500,000 fungarium records. So as you see, we still um, got a little way to go. Um, and funding and digitization efficiency often does not match. So this is sometimes a, a bit of a, a, a problem. So because research is often geographical based or a particular group of, uh, of species and the specimens to be digitized can often be located in all areas of the collection. So you're often returning to the same cupboard multiple times. And the method of selecting can make a big difference in digitization efficiency. So, you know, obviously the most, um, the best method is just to select it cupboard by cupboard approach. So you're selecting whole family or genera and selecting material by country level. For example, Angola, which is not that represented, well represented in the collection, you'd have a 50% reduction in rates. So wherever possible, we are taking a cupboard by cupboard approach. But if, um, if, certain projects come up then we will who want to use particular data that is scattered we still we will still do that so as i've mentioned at the beginning we thought we couldn't do that but imaging technology speeds have increased so you would just think about the camera on your smartphone in fact you know when we uh, started there were no smartphones <laughs> so if you just think about how much your camera um, has, has has improved that's also the same with imaging so back in 2004, we were using uh, flatbed scanners because there were no digital cameras that could produce the resolution that we wanted. So this was a particular um, ISP equipment called a herb scan that was developed by one of our photographers. But it, and it would have been a flatbed scanner, which was turned upside down. But then you, it would take three minutes to scan a specimen. So one person would use two machines waiting for one to scan. Um, and so you would, use, you would set up a specimen on another machine. So whereas before you could only do 80 to 100 a day, now you can image the same amount in about an hour, you know, for one person. So for us, it's for the plants, it's very important to create a very high resolution image. So around 600 PPI. So we want it to be sort of equivalent to a bit like looking down a hand lens. So taxonomists can start looking at structures and you can make identifications from the, from the images where possible. 
And so you'll be able to take measurements also of plant parts from the images. So uh, as mentioned before, it was possible to digitize the whole herbarium. And in fact, a few others had managed to, has done it before. So Paris, the um, Natural History Museum, and the Natural and Biodiversity Center in the Netherlands. So um, we undertook a small outsourcing pilot in 2015 with the London Natural History Museum. And um, we did this with an external supplier called Picturei who had worked with natural artists uh, before. Um, so most people who have completed the whole herbarium have outsourced their digitization. Um, so we imaged the solanum, which are the potatoes in there, uh, which contain the potato and tomatoes in that family, and the dioscoraceae, which are uh, the yams family. Um, so specimens were shipped to the Netherlands. It's always a bit scary when you're shipping your precious collection overseas, but it was only a, a small part of it and it, everything worked out fine. And they um, imaged it on this uh, conveyor belt system, which is called a DigiStreet. So one person would unpack the specimens um, from their boxes and put them on the conveyor belt. The other person would um, move them from the conveyor belt, uh, from the, the, the pile to the conveyor belt, um, and barcode them. And then the specimens move under the conveyor belt under the black box and the specimen image will be taken and there'll be a person at the other end that takes the specimens off the conveyor belt and puts them, make sure they're put back in the folders in the right order. Um, the, conveyor belts, the conveyor belt is controlled by the person who takes the specimens off the other end. So there's no problem with anyone with the specimens falling off the end or anything. Um, and then the images were um, transcribed by a team in Suriname. So what are the main successes and challenges? Well, obviously there's always worry about non-experts holding, holding, handling material, um, but they were always good. So we had no complaints or issues that have been highlighted in since when the material has come back and nothing has been turned up. It's been about like five, seven years now. Um, but Q staff did go over and train and made sure that the specimens were being handled properly and that the order was being maintained. Um, we had high imaging throughput, so there are around 3,000 uh, to 4,000 images created per day. Um, and collaboration with the NHM allowed more testing of different variables and workflows. And this project has enabled us to determine staff resources and costings for a larger scale project that we're just embarking on now. Um, so the challenges are really logistics for imaging off sites, kind of really resource heavy. You've also got the risk of um, moving the material itself. But um, to stop pest damage and prevent pest outbreaks, um, we need to freeze the material, come back, back into queue. So it's just the logistic, logistic amount of effort to make sure that we can freeze all those volumes coming in and out, going back into the building. Um, also, the supplier struggled with identifying sheets with more than one specimen. So, so um, probably it's only, we don't know exactly how many um, multi-specimen sheets that we have, but probably about 5% of the collection. So you'll find more than one plant specimen on a sheet. Um, communication was very good, but, but we probably needed a little bit more up to face face to face meetings at the beginning, but it was, you know, quite a, a small pilot, but and the big ones we will make sure we have more face to face meetings with the supplier. Um, we need a we needed effective protocol regarding qualities for data standards and to in, uh, quantify our expectations of image quality and to make and the quality the transcription quality was good but more thought was probably needed about how much interpretation that we wanted the the transcribers to do um, and dealing with exceptions so um so we have been falling hard behind other institutions on this but we had had full support from the director the executive board and the and the board of trustees so we have tried to find funding for this project for a while and we've and um, we've done the cost for a four year project. I mean, it's a lot of money because it's a massive collection is 29.3 million pounds. Um, but we have secured 10 million pounds from DEFRA funding. So we're just kicking off a um, two, the first like two year of parts of the project. So the main aims as outlined in the business case is obviously to make this data available to facilitate and accelerate strategic and novel scientific activities and to significantly increase access to the herbarium and the fungarium collections. 
you know, and to make sure that Q's collections, so that we don't fall behind others, and Q is still a global leader, one of the many global leaders in plant and fungal science. We also protect the collections and to provide a backup copy of this data. Um, we know that it won't mitigate everything because obviously you can't take a DNA sample from a herbarium specimen or fungarian specimen. You can't do chemical analysis. But if the worst did happen to the collection, then we at least we'd have this digital surrogate. Um, we also, a part of the project is to make a more efficient use of the tra tracking, the use of specimens. So there's a lot of requirements under developing access to genetic resources and benefit sharing legislation, which like includes the Nagoya Protocol. So you want to be able to track particular specimens from where they were um, collected in permits to their, to how, and how they're being used and to enable efficient collections management. So this can be a reduction in the cost of transaction management. So the Herbarium Collections Digitization Project has three aspects. So is the digitization itself, again, just the Herbarium and the Fungarium at this stage, the um, new database for collections, because we had out of date content management systems, all the different collections were in different systems that didn't talk to each other. And we also wanted a data portal that was more user friendly and not all collections actually had an outside facing portal. So um, work has been underway. Um, we issued the tender in February for the outs for a supplier um, and it was evaluated and awarded in May. So we're now in contract negotiations uh, with a successful supplier which actually is a different company. It's a UK based supplier called Max Communications. And actually rather than a conveyor belt approach, they're using a copy stand workstations. But we aim, and they were aiming to digitize the whole of the barium in the next four years. So it's quite an ambitious, we're just embarking on this quite an ambitious timetable. And um, so the pilot demonstrated that outsourced staff could not identify multi-specimens uh, very easily. So we decided that we'll do some of the work in-house as well. So this is, um, we were barcoding and imaging the, barcoding um, and imaging the orchids, because as you can see, orchids quite commonly have lots of plant specimens on one sheet. So here's a sheet with like eight different uh, species, uh, specimens on it. So it's quite hard if you're not really trained to be able to identify um, how many there are on this one sheet. And then the fungarium that are in lots of different packets on one sheet. However, we'll send these um, images over to the um, a supplier to then transcribe. And then large bulky specimens like palms that do not sort of often lend themselves to such a mass digitization approach. Um, we, we'll have to, you have to refocus in between each, each one really. And then also maybe stitch some images together. So yeah, so at the moment we're at the implementation stage. Um, so we've got quite a lot of challenges. If you imagine there's a large number of specimens to digitize in a short time frame. We do not know exactly how many specimens we have. So we, you know, so the scale, we'll have to monitor this and see whether we reach the end sooner or we have many more than we think. Um, we have a large recruitment drive. I've never recruited so much in my life as recently. <laughs> so we have approximately um, 36 staff recruited. So even though we have an external supplier who bring in their own staff, we still need managerial operational staff, project support, data managers who will get the data into the data and images into the system, quality assurance staff, um, curators to make sure that they're handled, the specimens handled properly, digitization officers, portal developments, IT staff, you know, you can imagine. Um, and then there's a lot of new project as we gave out, we have a lot of new staff. So we have a lot to think about the working space, but actually a hybrid working is helped. So we thought this was gonna be a massive problem. At the moment it's okay because, you know, with the, some people working from home a lot of the time, we've managed to um, find enough space in the, in the herbarium. And then we have a large training program that um, the, the, we have to um, train up with all the new people. And also ensuring our storage network and data management system is suitable for ingestion of these large number of images and data, um, up to 10,000 images a day that might um, have up to like 250 megabytes per image. Um, and we've also, I mean, we're not close, while this process is going on, we're not closing the herbarium or the fungarium to visitors. So there's, we have to minimize the impact on users of the collection. 
Um, at the moment, there'll be some anxiety at the start, and there is, but there's strong support for um, for staff or digitisation. Um, so at the moment, we just have to make sure that um, communication is key, and that we ask and we answer answer people's questions and concerns. You know, where are we going to be when in the digitisation, and and where what parts of the collection will be digitised at which point? Oop. Um, so I mentioned um, image quality. So we wanted to quantify the image quality because it can be very subjective if you're just looking at an image. So we quantified image quality against FADGI guidelines, the Federal Agency's Digital Guidelines Initiative. And the supplier was asked to provide examples of the golden thread device, level target, an example herbarium specimen image with an object level target. Um, and then we could provide a fake herbarium specimen if they needed it. Um, the image quality was assessed using golden thread analysis software. And so they were then determined if images reached two or three star FADGI ratings for our defined image parameters. And then images also were assessed by visually assessed by taxonomist. And then a sample of images will be analyzed this way during production and images will also be checked visually against quality criteria outlined in the tender. And then similarly for um, data, I mean, the labels are not easy to read. Um, there are lots of different handwriting styles. There are many different languages, although we don't ask people to translate, but they would just have to understand the, um, the information to know which fields they go into. I mean, it's quite standard information somewhere on a label, but there can be all sorts of different places on the label. Um, there are changes in locality names and country boundaries over the time. Um, so we need a clear transcription protocol with example labels showing how to interpret the data. So we'll be building on the one that we used in the pilot. And we need, just need a method for transcribers to ask questions for us to respond promptly. Um, so the SPI will have all their, their data quality um, software systems, if you like, but we'll also want to um, maybe use some sort of uh, Google Doc um, style where people can paste any questions that they might have. So then the images will need to be imported into our DAM and digital asset management system and transcribed data will need to go into our collections management system. So we have a, we'll have a, a large number, you know, we're increasing our rates quite substantially. So we'll have to create quite a smooth pipeline. So um, we um, recently tendered for a new collections management system, which is actually called EarthCape, which is a Finnish company. And we've gone some way already into replacing our old bespoke databases. So the DNA and tissue bank herbarium and spirit collections went live last year. Our transactions, so our loans, borrows, um, and incoming material where we're tracking consignments went live early 2022. And our fungarium collections um, are live in, uh, will go live in a couple of weeks. And then the Millennium Seed Bank and other collections to follow. But the idea is when everything's in, then say we can link collections easier. So a seed collection um, can be linked to its herbarium specimen voucher that is collected at the same time. And then when you sample DNA from a herbarium specimen, so that uh, parent-child relationship can be more easily recorded. And then apart from just Q, we want this data as widely as possible. So data will be harvested by aggregator sites, including GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. I hope many of you are aware of it. Um, so in 20, and also that helps us a way of track specimen use. So in 2021, there were 327 publications that included the use of Q herbarium specimen data that had been downloaded from GBIF. And um, so as I mentioned, we might still use an element of crowdsourcing. Um, this would be been using to help us um, do some transcription, but also for public engagement. So we use Digival, which is created and managed by the Australian Museum in collaboration with the Atlas of Living Australia. And we have crowdsourced over 130,000 records this way with over 1,500 volunteers. I mean, the majority have been done by, few um, by a sort of a core set of volunteers. So um, information is packaged into what's called expeditions. Um, which is um, so it's a bit like going on a virtual expedition. It's not actually um, the specimens that you collected from one expedition, but it's just a way of packaging it up. And it's usually linked to a particular project. So for example, this was um, Kim Walker's PhD project, and this was databasing all our Chinchona bark collection um, for her PhD uh, project. 
So quinine is an alkaloid extracted from the bark of the chinchona or the fever tree. And, and if you ever had a gin and tonic, you'll be familiar with the bitter taste of the tonic, which is the quinine. So it's mainly used now to add flavor to the, to the gin and tonic. But you probably all know that it's also one of the most important drugs in history. And it was discovered and it was used as a treatment for malaria. So she was linking the bark collection to the, the collection in the herbarium specimens. Um, so this was, you know, with um, she used these volunteers to help her with her PhD research. So I wanted to just finish up with the last part of the talk. I wanted to talk about um, the use of the digitized data. So um, with Reflora, um, we, um, it's been going a little while now and it's the online virtual herbarium and also the flora of Brazil. And so we want to know how it's currently used and their impact, particularly on conservation science, science because that was the thinking behind why it was um, produced. So we conducted a literature survey and an online survey of people using the, the, the resource. So half the 806 scientific publications in which Reflora was cited and the 81% of the over 1000 survey respondents accessing the resources mentioned conservation related research. Um, and so it looks like people are using it for conservation purposes. Um, top uses were conservation assessments, um, looking at distribution, and also finding um, a new species. And for the, the two landmark publications came out that were would not be possible without the Reflora research, uh, without the Reflora resources. Um, so for the first time, the plant diversity of Amazonians lowland rainforest is quantified based on a taxonomically verified species list which is then underpinned by the herbarium, the vouchers, the specimen vouchers, and have been identified by specialists. So we know that they've been identified correctly. And then a second landmark publication lists all known native New World vascular plant species. So it was the first catalogue of the plant diversity of the Americas. So this herbarium, so getting out this herbarium data, um, like what's in the collection is vital to help all these different um, resources. Oh, oh, here we go. Sorry, it went too fast. <laughs> um, so while we digitize the collection, we think there could be many new species in, in Q's collections waiting to be discovered. Um, so this is kind of, you think maybe new species are found in the field, but often they can be found just waiting to be discovered in collections. So these are just a few examples. So um, Dr. Martin Cheek and an MSc student, Charles King, came across a distinctive pitcher plant specimen at Kew when it was loaned from the herbarium at the University of Pennsylvania. And this specimen was designated then as Nepenthes maximoides. So, you know, unless they had a chance to look at the specimen, it, this time it was physically loaned to them. But eventually, when specimens go online or digital, it would be some more people can see it more widely. And so they more new species might be discovered. Um, and then this piece has not been seen since its collection 110 years ago in the Philippines. And then similarly, um, our orchid specialist, Dr. Andre Schutman, discovered a new species of orchid, Dendrobium azurium, while looking through unidentified Dendrobium specimens from New Guinea at the London Natural History Museum. So what alerted him, so he thought, oh, this looks a little bit different, but what also alerted him to the, that it might be a new species was the description of the color of the flower from the label. Because um, it says it was a blue orchid and it's kind of very rare to have like the blue and blue flowers are quite rare in, in botany. Um, yeah, so then he then so did find out to be that it was a new species and it was published. Um, so there really could be many new species waiting in Key's collection to be discovered. And then the use of herbarium specimens in conservation assessments. So as we've seen from the flora survey work, that's one important um, use. So the IUCN is the most authoritative source of information on the extinction risk of specimens. And much of the data contributing to an extinction risk assessment can be found on herbarium specimen labels. So that includes information on taxonomy, geographic, geographic range, population, habitat and ecology, threats, use and trade, and the example on the right, Pseudohydromus evo, was recently discovered as a new species following re-examination of the specimen material at Kew. And as it's known from just three sites, 
um, from the Evo, for Evo forest in Cameroon, the species, species has subsequently been assessed as critically endangered. So the locality information captured in her specimen labels is crucial to understanding the distribution of plant species. So the locality data is pulled together to produce, um, and it's sort of specimens may then have to be georeferenced if it doesn't have a coordinate. So that's not included in the digitization project, but it would be a particular element that you'd have to do after the locality data has all been transcribed. But then you get a, um, it's assigned a set of coordinates, which is then used to inform in distribution maps. So when conducting conservation assessments, we evaluate whether a species is threatened according to parameters relating to distribution and population. Um, however, for plants, comprehensive population data is very rarely available, and as a result, the majority of threatened plant species are assessed as threatened on the basis of restricted distribution and continuing decline in habitat range or population size. So as herbarium specimen data underpins extinction risk assessments and the accompanying distribution maps, it is essential that data is transcribed as uh, precisely as possible. So here we have, uh, we have two examples of data point projections for species here. However, the data contributing to the top example includes a record that has been georeferenced just to the centroid of Angola rather than a more specific location. So according to the extent of occurrence assessment parameter, the area within the polygon, then um, the species would be classified as least concern. Um, however, removal of this imprecise point reveals that the species is actually threatened and would be assessed as vulnerable. So therefore accurate herbarium data is critical in producing conservation assessments. So um, another way that specimen data is used is the identification of important plant areas, you know, which areas are best to um, prioritize for conservation. Um, IPA is a criteria based system actually produced by established by Plant Life International, um, but it's with sites being identified based on the presence of threatened species, threatened habitats and or exceptional botanical richness. And of the range of research activities that need to be conducted to imply the criteria, those in red are reliant upon collating herbarium specimen data as a major source of information on species and their distribution. So this workflow shows how herbarium specimen data are integral to TIPA's data workflow. And the large majority of data that feeds into TIPA's assessments already exists primarily within the herbarium. And so digitization of data on target species is critical to the process. So we would hope that our large digitization project can help with all these different TIPA's um, projects. So this is an example of Mozambique from Mozambique, and it started by collating and mapping all known data on the strict endemic and cross-border endemic species of the country. The map on the right shows how the point data can then be transformed into uh, species richness data per area, in this case, quarter degree squares to reveal hotspots of diversity. Um, so there, so this work was published, published paper, and that was basically based primarily on herbarium data. So this shows how the mapping of richness in endemic, near endemic and threatened species relates to the selection of TIPA sites. So in total, 57 TIPAs has been identified from Mozambique, much of which clearly corresponds with the concentration of endemics and threatened species. The 57 sites make up less than 3% of the total land area of Mozambique, but hold important populations of 83% of the threatened species and over three quarters of the endemic species. Hence, this offers sort of an economical method of prioritizing plant diversity in Mozambique through conservation prioritization. Although at present, fewer than half the sites have any form of formal protection. So it's just a sort of an example about how herbarium data is really being used uh, by key scientists. And then um, this is a, a final example based on the images. So this is talking about, you know, with large mobilization of large scale data sets of images through herbarium digitization. This provides a rich environment for the application and development of machine learning techniques for species identification. Um, you know, however, their limited access to computational resources and uneven progress in digitization, especially for small herbaria, still present barriers to the wide adoption of these technologies. Um, there's a lot of work that's been going on and some good work about species identification, but there's still a lot more to be done. And this is an area where Q will be looking to, to um, increase in the next few years. So 
Um, Barnaby Walker at Kew is investigating using deep learning to extract representations of herbarium specimens, uh, useful for a wide variety of applications, so so-called representation learning. So deep neural networks automatically extract relevant features or representations. And representations learned from large image data sets can generalize to other tasks. So maybe more, but you could make models built on small data sets for specific tasks more effective. Um, so he's looking at different types of neural networks, which will give different representations. I want to find the type that gives the most generally useful representations. Um, so there's different supervised learning neural networks trained to classify images using a labeled data set, whereas self-supervised uh, networks, on the other hand, are trained to perform tasks where the labels are created from the images themselves, such as reconstructing the original image after some transformation or identifying which of the two images is a transformed version of the target. So different neural networks need different levels of supervision. So um, uh, Baz or Barnaby is looking at these type of things to look to see um, how machine learning and, and deep learning can help us with um, species identification. Um, so there's a lot of potential and yeah, and so we'll be expanding into this research. So um, yeah, so that comes to the end of, of my talk. <laughs> so I'd just like to thank a lot of people. So I've talked a, a lot about other people's research. Um, so kind of some of the, so if you have some of these questions, I admit I'm not an expert in some of these areas. So um, I might have, especially the machine learning, deep learning. So um, I can put, if anyone has specific questions about those particular aspects, I can also point them to the, to the, to the experts in those areas. So John Adcock, thanks, he's the ICMS program manager. Then Jack Plummer, who's our plant assessment coordinator. Um, Ian Derbyshire leads our TIPAS program and Baz leads our deep learning. And also thanks all the digital collection staff, past and present. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm welcome to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so anyone who has any questions, can I encourage uh, to use either the chat or the Q&A uh, session? Um, so I'll, I'll start with a question myself to give everybody an opportunity to, uh, uh, to put questions on the Q&A bit. I'm curious about, um, so to give you some background, we, you know, I know of other collections and other collections that go through this process of digitization. And I'm well aware of the stop start process of funding where you get a bit funded and other bits not. And in your talk, you started from, a, from describing a set of funded projects to then a more systematic general approach. And I'm curious, how did you, how did you deal with funding and how did you fund that, that, that larger systematic approach? I mean, what, what are the, some of the challenges around how you're funding all of this? Yeah, so um, I have to admit a lot of the, 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 the countries that have managed to fund the whole projects have always come from government funding. It's quite hard to get funding um, we are trying to trace other bits of funding, but philanthropy funding like the foundation, it's harder because the impact sometimes doesn't come till later. So in the re in particular research project, you say one particular country, they just really want the, say, the specimens from a particular country. So it's really been a lot of effort has been put into business cases with the government, really. And, 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 and so we have been successful in that approach. So that's the only thing, reason why we've been able to start the project really is with government backing. Um, but then we're, we also hope to leverage some, we work with foundation for some individual supports or, or other funding projects might, if one's come up, we might try and work out synergies between them. So yeah, so yeah, it is tricky. It's not an easy thing really. So it, it's, it's complicated to do this systematically then? in the sense of having a systematic plan of this is this is my collection this is how i'm systematically going to go yeah i mean if you it. want to do it in like four years i mean you could maybe use volunteers we so say if we had um people that um, were interested in just columbia for example so we would um we would then try and say well our the way our collection is split up we won't just do columbia we will do region 17 because then we know we don't need to go back into that particular section of the cupboards so we would, so then we, 
And actually that is just as fast as selecting out just the ones from Columbia for that particular area. So sometimes we do bigger chunks than we would have done otherwise. And then we can mark that carbon and say, we're not going in there again. So, <laughs> so where we can, and it doesn't slow us down, we do a bit more, we do more um, chunks, if you like, than we would have before. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, on the, so I have a question here, I'm going to more generalize it, but on the um, geolocation, because I assume you're dealing with um, specimens that were collected years ago to many years ago, there was no GPS at the time. Yeah. So exactly how do you get to a point where you're satisfied with a, with a geolocation type? Um, yeah, yeah. So at the moment we, it's not been included in the digitization project at that point because it is quite expensive. So it will be done afterwards within other funded projects when, but we'll have which specimens that we know we have and then which specimens that need georeferencing. Um, so we can't, the way that we've done it before has been, um, there's a lot of work goes into it, looking at old maps. And so it is, that's why it's very sort of expensive. Um, so, but when we have a whole volume, you'll see, hopefully there'll be some um, sc um, scale where the same locality comes up quite a few times because, you know, the collector might go to the same collectors, collector place. So then you'll be geo-referencing to the same, um, the same locality. So there might be like 10 specimens from one particular locality that you can all, all geo-reference at the same time. Um, so georeferencing, there is sort of mass, um, there have been in the past some projects to look at whether you can georeference automatically using like programs to look at the text and then see whether um, you can automate georeferencing. And there have been some progress in that, but there's nothing really available there at the moment. So I know people are looking and there's been lots of uh, research on that. So this will be, we'll have to really um, get a researcher in to investigate and, mm -hmm. and collaborate with other institutions. So yeah, at the moment it's quite a manual process um, and it is quite long, takes quite a while. Yeah, but having all the locality um, transcribed is, a, is still such a massive, like invaluable. part of the process, yeah, yeah. You know, it's absolutely invaluable as you showed later with, uh, with the various examples. Um, another question I have, which is which is an interesting one, right? Is so as as you went through the process of digitization, the quality of the imagery and the ability to image has improved over time. Um, so, how do you how do you manage? You know, you have higher resolution images now compared to the past uh, for each record on average. How do you how do you deal with as technology advances? Um, how do you keep how do you manage that digitization process yeah so actually because the more with that, actually the, the because we already started at 600 ppi the resolution actually our resolution hasn't improved hasn't increased that much in that sense because but it was just the time it takes to produce that image has improved but yeah technology um always moves on so we're always just testing new camera equipment to see what comes up to see what's better um and but you know so basically you want to in some ways you want to get them the most that you can afford at the time and then you know because it will have a lifespan so we're always sort of we've got an image specialist at queue and we'll keep an eye out um you know what um technology is about there and then have like an upgrade plan for our for our equipment really so yeah would you have to re-digitize um specimens if you suddenly find that the quality of the imagery is old or would you use a digital approach to to touch yeah. up already yeah it's always, yeah it's so that thing is it's always that you could wait forever until it improves and improves but at some point yeah. you just got to do it and you don't really want to do it again yeah. so that's why we've kept with this well this will tell us that hopefully that this is a good balance between resolution and file size and also we can do this now and the cost and yeah, this is the best that we can do at the time. Let's do it. And hopefully that gives us enough uses later anyway to future proof us to a certain amount. But goodness knows what will happen like in another 80 years, but it's a big process to do again. So, you know, you're, we're trying, that's why we picked the, to, to produce not lower resolutions from the beginning, but higher resolution images. So that taxonomists could actually start doing identifications from it really. 
Okay, I have uh, one final question. Oh, it's about time for one final question. And this is something that lives very much in the digital environment. It lives very much in Merck, where we also are continuously thinking about uh, digital technology. Um, it's around the carbon footprint of this exercise. So uh, would you have a sense of the carbon footprint of the digitization and data storage, uh, as well as compared to the carbon footprint of researchers visiting uh, or the specimen being sent out? Um, it'd be interesting. So in essence, uh, what, what the question alludes to is through the digitization process, are we actually being more carbon efficient than um, if we were to do an equivalent kind of research elsewhere? Um, uh, yeah, I think so. Um, so sometimes digital, so it's a bit of different. So we do send lots of um, images on loan instead of specimens on loan. So we're definitely not transporting so, you know, as many, because what happens is um, people can narrow down their search a lot. Sometimes they still want the specimens on loan for certain, certain reasons. Um, but they can narrow down what they really need. Some people don't need the physical specimens at all. Um, what we might find, though, is what we hope to find as well, is that people now know what we have. So in some ways, it's so so that we might have still some people. Now we have these specimens, might ask them on, on loan for certain other reasons that we didn't they didn't know we had them before. So it'd be quite interesting. We do think that it will be a, a decrease in loading out material, but also, yeah, we would hope that we yeah, the, yeah. it'd be quite interesting to see. Um, Sometimes we might have a less because they were thinking, well, maybe there's less taxonomists as well. So how much is the background of taxonomy um, being used as compared to to because we've got stuff online? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah, so we need to kind of kind of have a look at that. But, yeah, I think we will be sending, you know, I think even at Q now, people will rather than go and look at the specimen, they might go and look at specimen on their screen. Uh, and look at, you know, they're searching the collection online to look and see, oh, what do I need rather than going in the collection? So, yep. yeah. That's a, that's a good news story to kind of uh, bring out around your efforts, right? That's yeah, and we saw that. Yeah, and in the pandemic, it's been really useful for people to be able to, you, we couldn't yeah. access the collection for a long time. And yet we could still send, you know, people still sell data and imaging. And we did crowdsourcing during the pandemic, you know, for our backlog. So, um, yeah, so... So that was, uh, you know, we were still able to search, serve researchers. So it's, yeah, it's even more kind of came to the fore during that period. Yep. Well, thanks a lot. I think that's what, what we all we have time for today. Um, and again, thank you so much for a very, very interesting talk. Uh, the moment we're going to done here, I'm going to disappear into the Kew Garden digital records and see what I can find. <laughs> yeah, we haven't got a nice portal at the moment. So. Oh <laughs> it will be coming. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's, there is a portal there, but it, yeah, it needs some improvement. <laughs> but it will be coming. Watch the space. <laughs> um, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we've recorded this session and we'll make it available again to watch on, our, on the Digital Environment website uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, again, a reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and the link is on the chat. Um, and um, I guess this is the final webinar of the series. Thanks again, Sarah. You've, you know, we've finished on a bang. It was a, it was a very, very good seminar. I really enjoyed it. Um, we're taking a break over the summer, um, and we will start again in the, in the spring with a new webinar series. Um, and we'll be in touch with the precise topics um, as we develop that further. So with that, thank you very much for attending this session and to our speaker uh, and enjoy the rest of the day.